we've got ministry happening in the altars. We're going to transition. We're going to release our children. Thank you, Jesus. Victory in the house today, amen? amen. Victory in the house. That's right. You can clap it up. You can give a clap offering to the Most High. I'm just going to have to talk loud. Amen. Hallelujah. I think I can do that. So where have we been over the last couple weeks? Ah, there we go. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But. The fruit of the Spirit is, help me, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So, what do we learn about love? Love is the root of all the fruit. Ready? The fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, we look at the fruit of the Spirit, we think this. It's a checklist. I got love. I got joy. This, <laughs> you guys stole the service from me last week. You can't do it again. I've got peace. And we, and we think this checklist, since I've experienced it one time, I've got it. But the reality is we're called to walk in it at all times. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. By and large, I think the Christian community, what we do is we try to fake it until we make it. And then a lot of times we forgot why we started faking it. No, what we need to do is recenter ourselves and recenter on the presence of God in our lives. Love, we're going to do a little recap. If you haven't been with me, we're going to do a little recap. Ready? Love. The Greek word is agape, which means divine love, which means God's love. There's a big difference between what the world thinks love is and what love really is, a divine love, a godly love. We see that the fruit of the Spirit are actually encompassed in a mashup with the love chapter. Love suffers long. It's, it's patient. And is kind. Kindness. Love does not envy. Peace. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Meekness. Does not behave itself rudely or provoke self-control. Does not seek its own goodness. Does not rejoice in, in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, joy, goodness. Love never fails. Love never fails. And since God is love, God's love never fails. God's love never fails. You know, if we were to cut away all of our pride and cut away of all of our self-centeredness, and we were to walk in true wisdom, true wisdom would answer one question. What would love do? What would love do? That's true wisdom. We talked about joy. Now you can hijack. Right? All right, all right, okay. I, I guess I get back. <laughs> but joy is what? It's not happiness. 
Happiness is an outward expression controlled by my circumstances, about what's going on around me. I'm happy when things go my way. Joy is something that's internal. Joy comes from a well from that, that is within you. How do we show our joy? Serve the Lord with? Gladness. Serve the Lord with? Who we were listening last week. Servitude is how we show our joy. Amen. Amen. Matthew 5, 13 and 14 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? I'm going to pose this to you. If love is the essential ingredient in agape, God love is the essential ingredient for walking in the fruit of the Spirit, what happens when you become tasteless? You've lost your God love. Now you're good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So what must we do? We must recenter ourselves. The love chapter ends kind of like this. Without love, I am nothing. That's how you get trampled underfoot. Being flavorless is being God loveless. He says, you are the light of the world. Joy is what illuminates that love and servitude and gladness of heart. And our joy will impact the world like a moth to the flame, baby. Some of us got to let our faces know that we have joy. joy. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> now he's giggling. <laughs> so let's talk about the fruit of peace. John 14, 27 says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace, Jesus' peace, I give you. Not as the world gives. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My peace is centered in Jesus. Peace is not normal. Peace is not natural. It's of Jesus. Left, left, our, own response, left our own vices, we would not have peace. Notice it says this. Let not your heart be troubled. Well, whose responsibility is that? Wow. Peace and power are under your authority. I'm going to say it again. Peace is under your authority. The Greek word that's translated here, afraid, is actually timidity. Even in hesitation, that is fear. That is being afraid. Even being hesitant about what you're supposed to be doing is fear. If you notice, there's a scripture when you walk in to the right of the, to the, right of the door. It says this. It's John 16, 33. This is the verse that my son uh, in the army, when the pastor was talking, he just let him know he had a Holy Spirit filled moment with this verse, and that's why I have it hanging on the wall out there. It's one of my favorite verses. It says this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, of joy. I have overcome the world. See, the Christian experience, the relationship with God, is not void of trouble, problem, and trash in your life. But be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world, and now I give you power and peace to do the same. You can overcome it. Be, put a smile on. Put a smile. Whatever you're going through in the week, guess what? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. So let's, 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 let's break this thing called peace down for a minute. What is the definition of peace? Definition of peace is to join prosperity, one, quietness, rest, set at one again. 
And when I read that, I thought to myself, that has got to be the best definition of peace I have ever heard. Set at one again. Hmm. Imagine this, coming into agreement with yourself. Have you ever had a decision to make? Red, blue, what happens? We kind of lose our peace, don't we? I, I, I need to buy a house. I, I got to get a car. I gotta, this is going to happen in my life. That's going to happen in my life. I lose focus. What happens to your peace? What happens to your peace when your mind's racing? It goes out the window. Right out the window, doesn't it? So imagine actually agreeing with yourself. Novel idea to set it one, to agree with yourself and actually being present where you are. We, we oftentimes transplant our, pre, our peace to a distant place in a distant time. If I buy a car, I'll be happy this car is just not that good. So I'll be happier if I have that car. And I war and I struggle until I get that car. What happens to peace? Out the window. Out the window. Same thing with a house. I'll be better. I've got three kids and two bedrooms. I'll be better off when I have three bedrooms and three kids. Oh, let's not double any of them up. I want four bedrooms. Oops, had another kid. Yeah, rose 10 years later. Oops, I got another kid. And listen, let's put it in spiritual terms for a minute. Right? Let's, I've got a godly desire. Lord, Lord, I want to found a church in your name for your glory. Good desire. Right? Good desire. What? But I, I got to have people come. If not, then they're in a church. So I'll be happy when there's people. Oh, wait. Now the people need a place to go. I'll be happy when I have a building of peace. So I fight and struggle and war towards that, right? I've transplanted my peace to a place in the future that I have not achieved. Yet, what happens after that? Well, I got another goal, Right? Chairs, carpet, all the roof needs done. Sound system. A lot of people need bigger TVs, right? So my peace is always transplanted to a place, a good godly goal. The assembling of the saints, we do not forsake that. Good godly goal, but guess what? I have put my peace into a place in the future, and now I am not one in thought. I'm never satisfied. So how do we come into a divine agreement with ourselves? Think about it for a minute. I'm three parts. What are our three parts? Body, soul, and spirit. Woo, body, soul, and spirit. Now, my spirit is reborn. New creation. New birth. Who gives that to me? Good. Spirit of God, right? Recreates me. So in that spirit, what do I have? I have everything that God has, and I have access to it, because he lives and dwells inside of me. So what's in there? The mind of Christ. But I got this soul. And silly, stupid Steve thinks here. Okay? All the dumb that's going on, all the knuckleheadedness is here. James says this, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So, as a believer with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, when the mind of Christ doesn't match up with the mind of Steve, now I'm double-minded. And now I have no peace. Because there's a struggle going on. There's a struggle going on inside my mind. Hello? 
Anybody? Or is it just me that lies awake at night thinking about dumb things? Uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm the only one that, that I get it. It's just me. I, I just should just preach this to myself. My bad. Oh, I'm not alone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Peace is inward stability even when you're falling apart. And you have this joy. We talked about joy last week, right? It's this assurance. It's this calm. That's inside of me. I have joy and I have peace. Listen, the joy of the Lord, Jesus' joy, allows me to sing when I've been in jail. Paul is jailed. What happens? He's got the joy of the Lord. That's his strength. And he starts singing. But peace allows me to lie down in a lion's den when they're hungry. Like Daniel. Do you see the difference? Mm. I, listen, this is just a new thought I've had this week. I, I really think that the fruit of the Spirit is sequential. Before, and this is just a thought, I might have to do a reprint next week. Who knows, right? But if, if love is the foundation and the manifestation of all the fruits. I've got to have that first. I've got to have a godly love in me. Right? Joy illuminates. Joy allows me to sing in the jail. But before I can fall asleep amongst lions, before I can fall asleep in the middle of a boat, as Jesus did in the middle of the storm, I've got to have the fruit of peace. I've got to have joy before I have peace. I've got to have love before I have joy. I think they're sequential. Just a new thought, right? Back when I was at the mill, it's a mill story, I know. It's a mill story. Mill story, baby, mill story. I'm an electrician responsible for installing new machinery or, or repairing old machinery. Something happened. I can't remember if it was a new machine or, or uh, there was some conduit that was messed up, but I had to walk back and forth from what you would call my workstation or where I was the maintenance man in this specific area. And I had to walk to the workshop. As I would walk back and forth from the workshop back to my work area, bending conduit, installing conduit, pulling wire. Hey, it is what it is. I get this recurring thought. How many know that God is spirit? What is thought? It's spirit. He's going to speak to you in spirit. Spirit, spirit communication through thought. I get this resounding thought. I need you to pray with that guy in that office every time I walk by. I'm like, well, yeah, no. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that. That can't be right. So I'm testing this theory all week. I walk by this office. I've got a piece of conduit. Pray with this guy. I don't even know this guy. Get, get, what? I walk by again, piece of conduit. I start testing it. I actually start walking a different way to go to the shop. And there I was pe- had peace with Steve's stupid mind, but I didn't have peace with that thought. Paul says, go, this thought says, go, go and pray. Go and pray with this guy. Right? But, you know, my mind kicks in. What's this cat going to say? What's this guy going to think of me? Is he going to reject what I got to say? What's he going to tell the other guys I work with? Each day. I hear that voice. It was a big job, apparently, because I remember doing this for about three days, four days. Friday rolls around, and I've had enough of this voice. Because it was, it was on me at night now, because I'm doing the whole debate thing. Is this you, God? Listen, ain't no part of Steve that's going to want to go pray for somebody outside of God at that time in my life. 
And guess what happens? I go, I muster up the strength, and I go into this office, and he's not there. That was on a Friday. That's what I thought, too. Saturday and Sunday roll around. Got my Jesus day going on. Sunday, guess what? That thought's still there. It's even more intense. Yeah, that's what I should have been doing. Okay, I'm ready. I'm going to go talk to this guy, but I can't find him again. Tuesday rolls around, can't find him again. Wednesday rolls around. Now I'm in a panic. Can't find this guy. So guess what I do? I start asking around. Hey, have you seen the guy that sits in this office? Oh, you didn't hear? No, I didn't hear. What happened? Uh, he's in ICU. 99% blockage in his heart. He almost died. Guy was off two months of work. Well, in my prideful, stupid Steve mind, said, you know, Lord, you're going to save him anyways. Why did I need to go pray for him? I mean, I mean, come on. As if it was my prayer that was going to save him. Oh, how self-centered was that? I've, list, I've learned a lot of things since then, okay? Not enough, but I'm on my way. Amen. Hallelujah. And this was the thought that God gave me. So he would have known that it was me that saved him. That rocked me to my core. And I immediately fell into repentance and this, Lord, I'm so sorry. And I'm so sorry for being prideful. And that was just stupid. That was just stupid, putting me before what you wanted. I loved me more than I loved that man. I had no peace, and my point to you was the mind of Christ was speaking to me. And what I failed to do was walk out what he called me to do and be the gladness and be the light of the world. I had lost my salt. Well, I had my salt. It was just flavorless. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? When you are at war with the Spirit of God within you, you cannot exhibit peace in your life. And we must not transplant our peace, even if it's a godly goal or a godly desire from this place to some futuristic tense, because it's always going to be more, 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 because Steve gets in the way. And I know I'm the only one that gets in the way of God around here. I get it. Okay? I'm preaching to myself. I know. I know. I understand that. Hmm. But I end up loving myself more than I love the people around me. So I had to go to God and say, okay, I'm sorry. I don't. And listen, I'm not proud of that story. I am not proud of that story. But guess what? Yeah. Because the resounding thought in my head preparing this week was this story. Well, thanks, God. Thanks, thanks for the, the experience. Amen. So listen. Our problem in Scripture kind of goes like this. See, the, here's what I'm going to tell you. It's normally in our prayer life, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but it's normally in our prayer life that we present the things that rob our peace, right? It's this is going on in my life, or, you know, remove this out of my life, or remove this person out of my life, right? You know, we kind of do that, don't we? Kind of somebody who's rubbed me the wrong way. Right? A little sandpaper going on in your life. Somebody rubbed you the wrong way. You're a sandpaper person. And God sent you to him to be the light and the hope of the world. And guess what? To show him Jesus. And, and you're trying to pray him out of your life. Hmm. So scripture says this. Let's go to uh, James 4. One, nah, we'll read a couple. Maybe 1 through 5. 1 through 3. Who knows? Where do wars and fights come from among you? 
Do they not just come from your desires or pleasures that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterer and adulteress, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity, division, the word enmity means division, with God. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously. What's he saying? What's he saying here? Lust, envy, coveting, are byproduct fruits of things that you are desiring in your prayer life. Do you understand this? He says, well, let's back up for a minute. How do we get these prayers answered? We bring them to God, right? We have communication with Him. If we're not having honest communication with Him and, and asking for things that aren't amiss, we end up ending up in lusting, coveting, and envying for the things that we want. This is what destroys our peace. This is my mind wanting something and the mind of Christ saying, eh, you're asking amiss, right? Or you just haven't asked the right way. You haven't asked the right way. If this, is, if this is truly a God desire in your life, this is a God goal in your life, he's put it there, then guess what? You need to come proper. You need not to try to do it on your own. So the fruit of this is what? The fruit of that is envy, coveting, and lusting. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're lusting for something, you're envying for something, and you get it, what's the reality? It owns you. It owns you. That relationship that probably wasn't a godly relationship, it owns you. Mm -hmm. So what's your source? Jesus. Jesus is our source. And whatever you plant in this heart, it will grow. So if you plant envy and you plant lust and you plant coveting, guess what's going to happen? It's going to grow. It's going to grow. So, with godly desires, what must we do? We must come into agreement with ourselves. What is it the fruit of? Peace. And I say come into agreement with myself because this is the spirit that God has given me. I, I consider myself one with God. So, I'm coming to an agreement with him. In actuality, I'm coming into agreement with myself as well. Are you tracking? Are you following? Are you following? Okay. Oh, who remembers my dino chicken story from last week? Huh? If you want to hear, I'll give you a little recap on my dino chicken story. Evelyn comes up to me and says, pop, pop. Now listen, I had to go get these dino chicken. They were hard to come by. I had to rob them from a little old lady. I had to outrun a, yoga, a, a, a soccer mom in yoga pants to get myself one bag of dino chicken. Okay? Listen, she's dressed, ready to run. So, I'm so proud, right? I got this dino chicken for my, my, my grandkids. And my granddaughter says to me, Pop, Pop, what's this? Because I made them wrong. Uh-oh. And there was moisture on one side. Oh, no. And she says, Pop, Pop, I don't need that. Now she's six years old. Okay? <laughs> Emmett, my grandson, he's four. I got to have equal amounts of ketchup and ranch on the same plate. <laughs> I had to convince him. And then when the ketchup bottle got low and he was squirting <laughs> all over the plate, he made me wipe it up on the plate. He's just done this to me recently. Pop up, what is this? You can't have ketchup splatter on a plate, Pop up. <laughs> then he goes through the hot and cold test. Too cold. Put it in the microwave. Too hot. So then he didn't, in turn, puts it in the trash. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to send you to see Jesus. They both up end up petitioning Pop Pop to go to McDonald's. And I 
gladly agree. I am done with this whole scenario. Right? Oh, they got chicken nuggets. Here's my question to you. Even though they did it kind of bratty and they did it the wrong way, do you, do you, do you think that they ever thought to themselves, if I don't eat my dino chicken, that I'm going to go and starve? Do you think that it ever crossed their minds that if I don't eat this, I'm going to eat nothing? No. Matter of fact, they upped their game a little bit. They're like, eh, dino chicken, we want McDonald's. Now. Do you think, do you think in their minds that they thought, mm, you know, hey, Pop-Pop ain't going to take us to McDonald's. They never would have asked. They know me. They know I'm going to do That never crossed their minds. Why? Because they know you how much you love them. Childlike trust. They trust Pop-Pop. Do they not? Right? So here's what I would tell you. Essence of peace is a childlike trust. They they trust me. I'm going to feed them. I have not failed yet. And the good news about feeding them is I get to feed myself. It's a bonus. It's a bonus. But this is how God wants us to approach him. With childlike trust. I trust the king of heaven, when I bring my petitions before him, I have this, man, I'm going to get my Donna chicken. And if not, I'm going to get McDonald's. Why? Because I trust him. I come to him with my issues. Remember, we lose our, we take the things that trouble our heart and we bring them before God in petition and prayer, right? And I don't want to transplant that peace we got to have childlike peace, not childish peace. Okay? I'm still working on that. They're six and four. We got time. Right? Are you tracking? Scripture says this. Be anxious for nothing. Oh, you guys. Do it again. Be anxious for Nothing. nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Be anxious for nothing. Now, by a raise of hands, I want you to know. Has worry ever blessed you? No. Just raise your hand. Just let me know. Worry blesses you? No. How about this? Has worry ever helped you? No. All right, better question. What do you think worry and worry does? What do you think worry and, 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 and anxiety, what, what, is it, what does it do to us? It grips us with what? Grips us with fear. Steals your, oh, steals your peace. Ah, Ah, now we're putting it together. Right? And worry is our feeble attempt to control the outcome, to control our circumstances, to be omnipotent. It's our feeble attempt. Fear is not a good way to guide your decisions. Just throwing it out there. What did we learn earlier? Timidity causes us not to walk into what God has asked us to do. Timidity also is fear, according to Scripture. But what do we know? 2 Timothy 1, 7 says this, For God has not given you a spirit of fear, original translation, timidity, even to hesitate, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So, if we were to complete this verse... Go back to uh, Philippians 4, 6, please. If we're going to complete this verse. I, mean, I, I, I thought I'd have a nice little cue and read it to you, but i got to go back over here. <laughs> what is the antidote for anxiety, fear, timidity, which leads to depression, antisocialism? What is the antidote for that? Oh, there it is. But in everything by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Prayer, supplication, 
thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. Get in the presence of God where peace exists. Pray, thank Him for who He is, what He's done. Amen? Get in His presence. Because in His presence is where peace exists. And it's the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Well, let's go to verse 7. We'll guard your heart and through Christ Jesus. So we got to come into his, pres- into his presence. And then in that, what do we do? We come into agreement with him. My peace is here in this moment. I am content. And I have not transported it to some distant place in some far off land. It's not the house that I want. Even the ministry that I want. I dream for this ministry all the time. Godly goal. But if I'm never satisfied with what God has given me, walked in contentment, thank Him, praise Him, in the moment of where I am, I have no peace, and He cannot build upon something that you do not have. God is awesome right where you are. Right? And He's going to guard your heart and your mind and stop you from making bad... How many of us want to stop making bad decisions? I tell everyone, follow your peace. When you have peace about something and your mind has come to rest, not because you've beat it into submission, but the power and presence of the Holy Spirit rests on it, guess what? I follow that. I follow that peace in my life. I don't put it off in some wayward place. Let's continue. Philippians 4, 7 7 through 9. Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Now, we are called to meditate in stupid Steve's mind on the things that are what? Let's. I'll go back over here. Are true, noble, just, pure, lovely. I am renewing my mind. To the things of God. And I am present in, his, in this place. And I am present with him. Now I have peace. Now I have contentment. Oh, I'm preaching way better than you guys are amen. And I'm just throwing it out there right now. <laughs> Meditation on Jesus. Meditation on Jesus and all the good that he's put into your life. The true things, the pure things, the lovely things, the just things. He has put those in your life. You are seeing what he has done for you. You're thinking on him. You're meditating. Oh, God, you are so good. And I am thanking him in this moment for what he is doing. I'm meditating on it. This is how the kingdom is established. The kingdom of God. Listen, we started this entire series on the kingdom of God and needing an inheritance to expand the kingdom of God, the fruit of the Spirit. What is the kingdom of God? Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Man, that's we're out short. But righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom. Now, we can do it eating and drinking. right? We can do these things. We can have some fellowship. But the reality is the kingdom of God is peace. Where do you carry peace? Right here. This is the kingdom. 
You are the kingdom. This is the kingdom. Whatever we take for the king is his domain. I expand the kingdom for him. It's right standing with God, and it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Man, it's joy in the Holy Spirit that just attracts people to the Jesus that is inside you. Inside you. Okay. Ready? Keys to maintaining the peace of God in the kingdom. Are you ready? Let me give you a few keys. First of all, it's the presence. It's being present in the moment with God. And it is the person of Jesus in relationship with him. All right? First thing that we must understand in our knower. We got to know that we know in our knower. Know that you are right standing with God by Jesus' blood. I am righteous by what he has done. I'm not warring in my own mind to do this and do this and do this and do this and do this so I can have salvation. The reality is he's done it for me. I rest in the fact that I have peace in what Jesus has done. Romans 5, 17 says this, For by one man's offense death reigned through the one much more those who have received abundance of grace in the gift Say gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. I know that he has given me righteousness. Well, why did Christ have to go to the cross? He had exchanged my sin for his sinless righteousness, divine exchange. I know that I know that I know I'm righteous. I got to love the scriptures. Point two, love the scriptures, love the word. Psalms 119, 165, great peace have those who love the law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Our love for the world, I mean for the word, will free us from anxiety, fear, depression. Because that is what teaches us and trains us. This is how we live, love, and look like Jesus. Next one. Keep your mind stayed on Jesus. Keep your mind. Guard your mind. Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded is death. What is carnally? Is being carnally minded sin? It's just operating in five senses. Just operating in the five senses. Hearing, smelling, tasting. I'm missing something here. Oh, yeah. Seeing, touching. Right? (laughs) These are your five senses. So what are we focusing on? What we can see? Are we being spiritually minded? Focusing on peace. You know, whatever thought patterns you have, I need some water. Whatever thought patterns, blah, 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 I'm not going to say it. Whatever you're thinking (laughs) can cause confusion, doubt, fear, discouragement condemnation are you with me so what do we do when we have these these thought processes I doubt you doubting thoughts I doubt you you I doubt whatever's coming into my mind because the reality is this I'm focused on Christ so whatever's coming against me fear doubt I doubt the doubt I doubt the fear I doubt the timidity. I doubt the depression. I doubt the anxiety. I doubt you. You know why? Because I'm focused on Jesus. I'm in his presence. Philippians 4.8, we go back to that. says, think, meditate on these things, the good things. Replace your thoughts with God's thoughts. Last one, trust. You trust in Jesus. Your trust is is in Jesus. How do we do that? Like a child. Childlike trust. And maybe he's not going to give you McDonald's. Maybe you're going to get dino chicken. But guess what? You can trust he's going to feed you. He's going to keep you in perfect peace. A heart that trusts God 
is focused on him and his word. So what do we do? Fear, anxiety, depression. When these things rise up in us, what do we know? I'm double-minded. I'm double-minded. Steve's mind's taking over. I got to cast these thoughts aside. But they are a gauge that I'm not walking in the fruit of the Spirit. It's letting me know I'm not trusting the Creator of all. I'm not trusting Him. And there's power in peace. We need to understand this. There's power in peace. I'm just going to skip to the end here. Well, I'm doing it again. It's going to be 1 o'clock, baby. So let's go to Luke 8. I'm going to paraphrase a story for you. Jesus goes to his disciples and he says, Hey, I want you to go to the other side of this sea. Who is Jesus? He's the Word. So guess what? The Word gave a word to the disciple. And they said, Hey, I want you to cross over this sea. Well, they start paddling. Jesus is asleep in front of the boat. He's like, listen, they're going to make it. We'll be okay. I'm taking a nap. They've been paddling on this sea, paddling on this sea, and this great windstorm arises. Now, who is the prince of power of the air? The enemy, Satan. He stirs up a windstorm. Waves are crashing over the boat. The boat's beginning to sink. Jesus is still asleep. Disciples, hey, hey, hey. Don't you care we're going to die? They must be having fun. Don't you care that we're going to die? What's he do? Yeah, he kind of shakes his head at him. Ah, they got to learn a couple lessons here. He stands up. Rebukes the storm, says, peace be still, and the waves and the wind obey him. The waves and the wind just settle. And they're in amazement. They're all, who is this guy that can control the wind and the waves? Jesus. Let's go back to our first verse. Peace I leave, my peace I leave with. You See, it was the peace of Jesus that is internal that rebuked the storm. You cannot give what you do not have, right? And he says, peace. He speaks out of the essence of who he is. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is available to you. This is available to you. Focus on Jesus. Trust Jesus. Know about Jesus. Read his word. This is available to you. And this is how we live, love, and look like him. Because it's not peace when everything's okay. It's peace in the middle of the storm. It's peace when there's obstacles and people that are just rubbing you the wrong way. Maybe we shouldn't try to pray them out of our lives. Maybe we start praying for them. Show them Jesus. Show them your peace. No matter what you do to me. No matter what happens, I'm going to exhibit this thing called peace because I love you. Because I love you. Just a few minutes there. Going back to what you said earlier about seeing that guy going back and forth from him. Well, I had a patient years ago that his sister contacted me and uh, said, my brother has cancer. They don't know how long he's going to live. I said, okay. And uh, he's in a nursing home. So that day, I had a ton of stuff to do after work. I'm thinking the devil's coming in. Have you got stuff to do? You ain't going to go pray with that guy. You know, you, you go another time, whatever. Um, um, you can go another time and pray with him. So I, I said, okay, I got done with work, jumped on the bike, went to the nursing home, and he, I came into his room, and he said, Oh, are you going to work on me? I said, well, I can. I said, but I come to do something more important for you. And so I talked to him, and, and I said, would you like to accept Jesus? I said, I'll pray for your healing first. Would you like to accept Christ? In case something does, does happen, you go to heaven. 
So he said, yeah, I want to do that. So I said, say it from your heart. So we prayed halfway through. He start, started crying. So we finished, and I started crying. And, you know, I left that nursing home, and the devil worked on me all day. But like you, God just kept saying, you got to go see that guy tonight. You got to go see that, that guy tonight. Guess what? That, di- that night he died. If I wouldn't have went and prayed with him, he would have never been in heaven per se. Maybe not, maybe so. Amen. But I was obedient. But I did stuff like you before I grew in that where God would talk to me and I wouldn't, wouldn't go through something. But always, yeah, he, always concerned about ourselves. Yeah, well, yeah. You our, know, it, it's, it's so reflective. It's, you know, yeah, it is. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. The reality is, I mean, you got to love them just as much as you love yourself. I was thinking about my selfish things. I had a ton of stuff to do that night after work, but I went. I'm glad I did because, like I said, that night he passed away. Thank you, Lord. I'm glad there's a success story amongst us. Amen. Hallelujah. Not just knuckleheaded Steve stories. So I've got. A, so I'm going to do open floor, open discussion. Let's talk about this message. Let's unpack it for a minute. Those of you got to go. I, I won't draw attention to you. I will not call your name as you leave the sanctuary. <laughs> I prompt. Well, it's Sunday. I can't fib. I will. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Get the floor rolling a little bit. Ready? What is the fruit that enables all other fruits? Love. Love. God is? Love. Love never? Fails. Oh, my gosh, you guys are doing so good. So God's love, agape love, never? Fails. And God's love is divine love. It's supernatural love. It's the ability to love people who are unlovable. Unlovable. You listen, you're gonna find some people in this world, and you're like, oh, I cannot love you. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So here's me another one. We've gone over this couple weeks. Joy is what? What is joy? My strength. Yeah, I'll, I'll take my strength. Go ahead. What else? What is joy? Fruit of the it, spirit. Oh, okay. There's Captain Obvious in the back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said light. The light of the world. Your joy illuminates. We got to let our faces know that we got joy. And when you take a basket and you put it over top of the light, nobody can see it. That's a frowny face. It's a frowny face. Yes, and joy is attractive, like a moth to that flame. Right? I'm a Christian. Jesus loves you. <laughs> I want to be a Christian at that point in time. That's so attractive. Right? So what happens when we put that basket over the light? It goes out. Nobody can see it, right? Nobody can see it. So let's step into this week's message. What is peace? Coming into a with yourself. Now, as a Jesus lover, he is inside of me. So I am agreeing with the spirit that is within me. I have come into agreement, right? I'm not double-minded. I got the mind of Steve, the mind of Jesus. The mind of Steve thinks he knows everything, but he's not. He's not that bright. I need the mind of Jesus to lead me and guide me. I come into agreement with the spirit that is inside of me. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, question for you. How do you come into agreement with yourself? I heard prayer, the word, worship. I'll take that's a fantastic one too. You know, when I was, when I first uh, when I first feel like I, I I started a real relationship with Jesus, worship was the most peaceful time to me. I wore it in my mind all day, every day, and it was that moments in worship that my mind would come to rest 
And I would just sit there, and sometimes I would just close my eyes. It took me a long time before I even started singing because I just wanted to experience peace in my life. Right? So to come into agreement with oneself, I must not push my peace where? Into the future. I don't want to push my peace into the future because Jesus is present in this moment. Right? In this moment. I don't want to displace my peace. I have it. I want it. So when I agree with the mind of Christ that is within me, then I have peace. And even though he's given me good godly goals, and even though I desire the things that he desires, I must not push my peace into some futuristic place, some futuristic part of my ministry. I'm just being self-reflective here. Okay? Just being self-reflective. Okay. Anybody want to share? Any, any, any more share moments here? So what I want to put in and encourage you is even as you are in the world, 